Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Durham O'Leary. I'm the Chief Economist with GoodBody uh, and also member of the organizing committee of the DW Irish Economic Policy Conference, uh, of course, kindly sponsored by Dublin Chamber. This is the sixth and the final uh, session of this year's conference, uh, and hopefully, uh, the last virtual one before we move back to a real world situation in Wexford next uh, year. Um, as, as you can imagine, every year as a committee, we sit down and discuss what are the kind of relevant policy issues of, of the day. And it does be, uh, I think, a, a, an intense uh, debate. Um, I, I think we've covered a lot of those issues uh, this, this week, such as, you know, how do governments pay? For the COVID crisis, uh, how do kids catch up on lost learning? Uh, the, the topic that we're dealing with today uh, on will inflation make a return was and still is a contentious one uh, with a wide range of, of views. And um, perhaps we should have renamed the session, is inflation here to stay? Uh, given that we've got confirmation today from Eurostat that Euro, that Euro inflation has reached a 10-year high of 3% in August, and the US inflation rate is, is over 5%. And um, there are, of course, those who say that this is only temporary uh, and that low rates uh, existed before the pandemic will return. But there's also those who are saying that there's going to be something more persistent. So a, a wide range of views that we probably won't get agreement on uh, today, I would have said. Um, but what we do know for sure is that this question will have huge implications for for policymakers uh, and indeed market participants over in the years to come. And that's what we're here to discuss. And we have a great panel uh, to do so. I'm going to introduce our panel uh, later on. But first, I want to get on to our keynote address to be given by Governor McLeod, uh, who took up the position in the Central Bank of Ireland in September 2019. He chairs the Central Bank Commission, is a member of the Governing Council of the ECB, a member of the European System Systemic Risk Board, and is Ireland's alternate governor at the IMF. Before that, he had numerous roles uh, across the world, including in New Zealand and the UK. And in the interest of time, uh, Governor, I, I'm not going to mention uh, th them all, but just to say that you know, many of your predecessors have joined us at the Irish Economic Policy Conference over the year, and where this is your uh, first outing. Uh, and we really appreciate you being here and we're looking forward uh, to your remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Dermot. And good afternoon, everybody. I, I know that the Dublin Economics Workshop has been an important forum to discuss economic and public policy uh, issues over many years. So it's both a pleasure and a privilege uh, to address you today. I'll start by giving an overview of the outlook for the Irish economy and the Euro area economies, and I'll then provide some historical context to the current inflationary dynamics we're seeing as we emerge from the pandemic. And I'll briefly outline um, uh, some key elements of the outcome of the ECB's strategy review, in particular focusing on our current revised inflation target and what the current dynamics might mean for monetary policy. And finally, I want to discuss the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy in a post-pandemic world. So let me start. The economy today is at a curious juncture. As with many aspects of our lives, COVID-19 continues to have a profound impact on the economy. We see it in the labor market, in government finances, and of course in inflation, the topic of today's panel. We also see light at the end of the tunnel, although there remains considerable uncertainty about the trajectory of the pandemic and its knock-on effects on the economy. Here at home, although the vaccination program has continued at pace, we saw the epidemiological situation worsened through August as public health restrictions were unwound. Cases are, however, expected to peak this month. After contracting in the first quarter of the year, domestic economic activity is continuing to increase at pace. The rebound in the second quarter with modified domestic demand increasing by 8.4% on a quarterly basis has been followed by further positive news in higher frequency 
business and consumer confidence indicators, labour market developments and indicators of consumer spending. All told, the outlook for the Irish economy for the rest of the year is increasingly positive. But the economic experience of the pandemic and the road beyond is not uniform across all sectors. Some of those less affected are reaching capacity constraints with a risk of sector-specific wage pressures. At the same time, some sectors have seen a surge in labour demand, partly driven by the pandemic, in areas such as logistics and sanitation. And now, as more face-to-face -face service sectors open up, vacancies in these areas are rising. Yet about a quarter of the labour force is still on some form of state support. Support through the pandemic unemployment payment and wage subsidy schemes insulated household incomes from the shock, but it has also led to difficulties in assessing the true state of the labour market. However, quantitative and qualitative indicators suggest that employment rates are recovering quicker than previous recessions, where firm bankruptcies and insolvencies were typically more evident. Costs are in increasing, particularly for indigenous businesses in manufacturing and services, while construction costs are also increasing. And we're seeing supply chain issues and energy prices, largely due to base effects, in particular leading to price pressures. So we're seeing both slack and bottlenecks. And it's not just an Irish phenomenon. Growth across the euro area has improved strongly. Confidence indicators across the eurozone are at their highest level in more than two decades, reflecting surging optimism among firms and consumers and boosting demand. Inflation, as we just heard, was about 3% in August for the euro area, as in Ireland, and we expect similar levels of inflation in the coming months. The latest ECB staff projections show a spike in headline inflation this year, resulting largely from temporary factors such as the rebound in the energy inflation rate and the reversal of the German VAT rate cut. Increases in input costs related to supply disruptions and one-off reopening effects on services prices have also added to the upward pressure. Now, these temporary effects are expected to dissipate in 2022, and inflation is likely to weaken again to levels below 2% over the medium term. But there is considerable uncertainty about the persistence of price pressures, and we need to interpret this data and the outputs of our models with caution. The pandemic is bringing about structural changes in our economy, which may only become more evident over time. At the same time, it has highlighted the importance of the interactions between monetary and fiscal policy for the continued economic recovery and in promoting price stability. But before discussing some of these issues, I'd like to give you some context to better understand the inflationary dynamics we're seeing at this curious juncture and how our new monetary policy strategy will guide us in our response. Over the past decade, we've seen euro area headline inflation average at about 1.2%, far below the ECB inflation target. Now, why is this? Long run trends like an aging population have weakened future expected demand. Waning productivity growth has disincentivized investment. We've seen a rise in markups and a surge in risk aversion in the wake of the global financial crisis. All these factors have contributed to a protracted global decline in the natural rate of interest. The natural rate is the rate of interest that balances the economy and that is consistent with output at potential and inflation at its target. While the rate is not directly observable, it is widely estimated to have declined or even turned negative in some cases across uh, most major economies in recent decades. Similarly, downward pressure on inflation has come from economies becoming more interconnected globally and more digital. Overall, while monetary policy cannot control all these factors, it must respond to them. This sustained period of low inflation required significant monetary easing on the part of the ECB and has led to the implementation of a range of extraordinary monetary policy measures. As part of those measures, we at the Governing Council reduced the deposit facility rate into negative territory. This is not unique to the euro area. Central banks across the world have set record low interest rates since the global financial crisis. A decline in the natural rate of interest is challenging for central banks as our ability to use interest rate policy 
which is our preferred monetary policy instrument, to stabilize the economy is constrained. Instead, central banks have utilized unconventional or non-standard instruments to ease policy and boost inflation. Instruments that have now become part of our toolkit, albeit those unusual tools that you ideally you would only look for occasionally. Now, these longer run trends were important features in the ECB's review of its monetary policy strategy. Given the length of time since the last strategy review in 2003, there was a need for a thorough <clears throat> and encompassing review of all areas of our monetary policy. At the launch of the review, uh, Christine Lagarde promised that we would uh, leave no stone unturned, and I believe we've kept that promise, although there remains a number of areas to explore further. As I'm sure this audience knows, the Governing Council concluded the review in July. There are five main outcomes that I would highlight. Uh, firstly, a new systemic inflation target of 2% over the medium term. Second, a decision to incorporate owner-occupied housing costs into our preferred measure of inflation. Third, an action plan to incorporate climate change into our monetary policy framework. Fourth, more structured communication with the public. And finally, more regular reviews of our strategy, with the next one expected to take place in 2025. Now, given the theme of this panel, I'll focus on the role of our new inflation target. Since the formation of the ECB, we have adopted a target to achieve the mandate of price stability. In 2003, after the previous review, the ECB's target was for an inflation rate of below but close to 2%. However, this objective was often accused of being both asymmetric and ambiguous. Asymmetric due to the wording of below 2%, which created a perception that the governing council would react more strongly to deviations above this level than below, and ambiguous as close to 2% did not give a precise point target. Despite Mario Draghi's attempts to clarify the ECB's reaction function as the euro area was hit by a series of deflationary shocks in recent years, the formulation of the price stability objective may have contributed to inflation expectations de-anchoring in the euro area, particularly in the proximity of the effective lower bound. In this context, the Governing Council decided to amend our price stability objective as part of the review. We will now aim for an inflation rate of over the medium term. This target is symmetric in that the Governing Council will treat deviations above and below 2% as equally undesirable, and it also provides clarity and consistency. So returning to the inflationary pressures we're seeing today, in line with the ECB staff projections I referenced earlier and recognising the prevailing uncertainty, I expect the current pickup in inflation to be transitory, and we have a lot of evidence to suggest that this is the case. But as my colleague Isabel Schnabel highlighted this week, there are growing indications that the current supply disruptions and commodity shortages could be prolonged. The longer the supply chain problems persist, the greater the likelihood that firms will pass through their cost increases into consumer prices. So we need to be both humble and uh, recognize the uncertainty reflected in the slack uh, and bottleneck conundrum, and also vigilant to the risks. In the meantime, it'll be important to maintain an accommodative monetary policy stance for some time to ensure the continued recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic remains solid. Raising interest rates in response to a temporary rise in prices would be harmful as we are trying to nurse the economy back to health. With the correct monetary and fiscal policies in place, a sufficiently strong demand-driven recovery should see inflation return to 2% over the medium term in line with our inflation target. And after a decade of too low inflation, we should welcome a growing uh, confidence and a faster than expected recovery to help inflation expectations realign more clearly, more closely with um, the ECB's objective. The medium term orientation of our strategy allows us to look through shocks that are expected to be transitory and act once we see a persistent path for inflation that is consistent with our aim. And our commitment to our new strategy is manifest for our decision to change forward guidance on interest rates in July. 
we wanted to provide reassurance that rates would not be increased until there is robust evidence and a high degree of confidence that the inflation rate will reach 2% in a sustained and durable manner, avoiding the risk of reacting to forecast errors or to short-lived forces generating inflation only on a temporary basis. In addition, as part of the review, the Governing Council recognised that while policy rates remain our primary tool for economic adjustment, we will continue using all monetary policy instruments, including new ones, as necessary and in a persistent manner in line with meeting our inflation aim. The change in the ECB's monetary policy strategy will ensure that we can better deliver on our primary mandate of maintaining price stability. But we must always remain conscious of the other policy areas that impact on our objective. Fiscal policy has a role to play in helping drive aggregate demand, sustaining the recovery and supporting the path of the ECB's target and the normalization of monetary policy. When it comes to the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy, the EU's Framework for Economic and Monetary Union, EMU, which was designed around 30 years ago, has shown its limits, in particular over the last decade. The framework underestimated the role of fiscal policy to counter the cycle. The experience of the global financial crisis highlights how the framework did not provide sufficient incentive for governments to build fiscal buffers during good times that could have been used to counter the negative shock that the crisis imposed upon the euro area economy. Subsequently, although fiscal consolidation was unavoidable in some countries, including Ireland, the framework obliged other countries in the euro area that had sufficient fiscal headroom to undertake a tightening too soon. For the most part, monetary policy was left to deal alone with the recession. That was a mistake. This understatement of the importance of counter-cyclical fiscal policy, combined at least in a first phase with some hesitancy on the monetary side in implementing decisive and conventional tools, did not help to produce a smooth recovery from the recession. Moreover, the insufficient policy response was poor at dealing with the emergence of self-fulfilling bad equilibria and most likely contributed to the subdued inflation that Europe has experienced over the last decade. Since then, the consensus with respect to the interaction and interdependence of monetary and fiscal policy has shifted. An appropriate coordination between the two is now considered to be important at all times. I do not see this as threatening central bank independence. Independence does not mean isolation. Most importantly, it is now clear that combining monetary accommodation with fiscal expansion is especially powerful to stabilize the economy when policy rates cannot be lowered further. At the effective lower bound, where monetary policy faces constraints, fiscal policy can have a greater impact thanks to the lower cost of financing debt. Combining monetary accommodation with counter-cyclical fiscal policy, while also avoiding fiscal dominance, may not only accelerate the recovery, but also affect long-run outcomes, improving trend growth, preventing damaging hysteresis effects, and the risk that multiple equilibria emerge. And when we look at the pandemic, the overall macroeconomic response deployed by European and Euro area institutions and governments has certainly been more coherent and impactful than in the years after the global financial crisis, precisely because of better coordination between monetary and fiscal policy. But this coordination has not been achieved as a result of the automatic operation of the existing framework. For the fiscal policy response to be adequate to the magnitude of the shock, it took the suspension of the Stability and Growth Pact. Arguably, EMU's fragmented macroeconomic framework emphasizes a point that I have made before, monetary policy needs friends. The creation of a completely new instrument, the next generation EU, has contributed to restore confidence. The incentives of monetary and fiscal authorities have so far been aligned in the response to the pandemic. This has contributed to counter the deflationary shock and keep the private sector economy at a level of activity which would have been much lower otherwise with potentially disastrous consequences in terms of job losses.
However, the current framework potentially allows for a suboptimal policy mix to re-emerge in the future. Substantial reforms are therefore needed to make sure that an appropriate coordination between fiscal and monetary policy is achieved systematically and not just episodically. The current framework has also been criticized for its excessive complexity and its reliance on unobservable indicators and real-time data, often subject to subsequent revision. Improvements on this dimension could enhance its transparency and effectiveness. Now, economies and financial systems never stand still, so it is good practice to evaluate all of our frameworks regularly to ensure they are fit for purpose. Rethinking the paradigm guiding the EMU fiscal framework should be an ongoing process. I also believe that the discussion should be inspired by thinking about the long term, about the challenges that the macroeconomy will face not only over the next three years, but over the next three decades. For instance, once we consider a longer time frame, the commitment to move towards net zero carbon emissions by 2050 will likely require a level of public investment alongside private investment that was not expected when the current EMU framework was developed. Having said that, the timescale to transform our economies is not very long. 2050 is closer to us than the fall of the Berlin Wall. To be clear, I'm not suggesting that a new framework should ignore public debt sustainability or the dangers of pro-cyclical policies. Such uh, considerations must remain central in any new system a sustainable policy remains a necessary condition for improving our economic well-being. The record high levels of public debt, not only in Europe, but uh, for most advanced economies, makes it necessary now more than ever to have realistic and credible anchors that can help to maintain sustainable public finances over the long term. But we should ask ourselves whether the parameters in use are still able to provide for that. Existing indicators could be upgraded to better reflect country-specific factors that can influence debt sustainability and macroeconomic stability in individual member states and for the euro area as a whole. They could, moreover, take into account not only the level of indebtedness, but also the composition and the efficiency of government spending and revenue collection, with particular focus on the way they can catalyze private sector investment to address longer-term challenges such as climate change. All these dimensions together ultimately determine whether in the long run, public investment will enable the necessary economic transition to take place so that future generations inherit a more resilient economy rather than a more fragile one. So let me conclude. Uh, there are many challenges in front of us and the ability of monetary policy to tackle some of them depends not only on the different tools at the central bank's disposal, but also on the actions of other policy areas beyond the central bank's control. When it comes to the risk of inflation, however, our tools have been tested and proved effective in the past. In this respect, it's mostly a matter of commitment to employ such tools if needed. I believe that at the moment, fears of excessive euro area inflation are overstated and that the current price pressures reflect transitory factors that will fade out over time. However, humility and vigilance are necessary so that we can react appropriately if conditions change. Our commitment to price stability remains as strong as ever, as does our ability to fight unsustainable euro area inflation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor, um, for those remarks. Um, plenty in there. I, I, I think this issue of transitory versus non-transitory, I'm sure that's going to come up again over the next uh, next hour or so. Um, and also this appropriate coordination uh, between fiscal policy and monetary policy, I think, is a is a really important area uh, and has shown to be, you know, since the pandemic began in particular. Um, so we're going to move on to the panel discussion and um, really three excellent uh, panelists uh, who I'm going to introduce uh, firstly. Actually, before I do that, so just to remind the audience that there is opportunity for questions, uh, just type it into the Q&A box and I'll do my best to get 
through uh, as many of them as I can. Um, but first of all, we're going to have uh, addresses of five to seven minutes by three speakers. And the first is Gideon Edgeworth. And Gideon uh, is a macro strategist with Wellington Management and is a member of the firm's global macro strategy group and the emerging markets debt team. Uh, she conducts research on external debt markets, local debt markets and foreign exchange in the Central and Eastern European region. Uh, she's an active participant in investment strategy groups focusing on both emerging market debt and equity markets and works closely with investors uh, throughout the firm all around the world. I think she translated her work into investable ideas and themes. And Gillian, um, Really appreciate you being here. Uh, this is your first time as well at the Irish Economic Policy Conference. Um, so the screen is yours. Thank you, Dermot. And I and thank you very much for the invitation. And I hope I can be as punctual as the governor was in terms of um, time allowance. Um, I, I just want to start by saying that um, the views I'm going to share here today are mine. They're not representative of um, my employer as a whole. Um, and I want to do a few things. One, just acknowledge some of the progress that Europe has made over the course of this crisis. Two, rather than focus on the transitory, think about inflation pressures over the next decade or so and what may drive those. And um, three, what challenges that generates for central banks. And then four, maybe just some quick few thoughts for what that means for the Irish economy. Uh, so where do we stand today? I, I think, you know, we're, we're very good at discussing what what doesn't work within the Eurozone, I, I think we should acknowledge that um, the starting point is a monetary union that has made progress and that has strengthened, I think, the union over the course of this crisis. And the governor's already said it, but just to reiterate, um, that improved balance or, or that, yeah, that improved balance really or the relative burden on fiscal versus monetary policy that we've seen over the last 18 months. And you know, that fiscal both coming from domestic budgets, but also coming from the recovery fund. And now we're layering an ECB strategy review on top that, that hopefully will edge average inflation higher going forward and reduce some of those more severe downside tail risks that we had been worrying about in the last decade. Now, where does inflation go to from here outside of what's happening to date, which is obviously some pretty record high inflation rates in, in the US, um, what we're seeing in Europe. And, and that's also a trend that we're seeing um, in some emerging markets. Um, when I think out over the next decade or so, um, my bias is that inflation will move higher. And that's due to a few factors. I think we're living in a world that is highly uncertain at this point, that there's many, many macro policies that are shifting and it's unclear where, we'll, where, we'll, where we will ultimately end. Um, but, but my sense is that there is enough in place that we will have some more at least modest inflation pressures going forward. And that's not necessarily a bad thing at all. Um, I'd mentioned four factors. One is climate that the governor has already mentioned. Two is a focus on inequality and social stability. Three are demographics and interesting to see um, Professor Goodhart at the Central Conference in a couple of weeks time. So that's on other people's minds as well, I guess. And, and four is just the trend in, in globalization. So climate change, what are we going to be doing with climate change? It's becoming increasingly obvious that we will need to invest relatively large amounts of money to maintain output stable. Um, so, so that to a certain extent is a supply side shock. And on top of that, it's becoming increasingly obvious that weather events are having more and more of an impact um, and physical climate risk is having more and more of an impact on prices. I'm thinking in terms of the volatility of food prices because of harvests semiconductor prices in Taiwan, and not to put the entirety of what we're seeing in European gas prices right now down to climate change, but, but certainly I think part of that is explained um, by climate change. Um, the second thing is inequality. Um, I think it's captured in the discussion on the minimum rate for corporate taxes um, across the OECD. We're beginning to see a rebalance between the division of income between capital and labor. And that hopefully over time will transform or will transfer more income um, towards those that have a higher propensity to consume. Um, the third is demographics. Over the last two to three decades, we've benefited from a very large supply side shock in terms of the global labor market. 
that's China, Russia into the WTO in the, in the late 90s, the fall of the Berlin Wall and what that's meant for European labor supply. Um, going forward, that shock has largely been absorbed. It's been a very, very positive supply side shock. Um, and I think what we're moving towards then is a dependency ratio in developed markets, which is edging higher. Um, so again, very difficult to time, very difficult to assess the magnitude of the impact, but it does point to another supply side constraint. And lastly, globalization, is it moving into reverse? I, I don't know. Um, it has stalled, um, but I think we are seeing increasingly across the world that disrupting supply chains is not easy. And if we do move towards some more nearshoring, um, again, there, it's unlikely to be disinflationary. Um, so, so there are sort of the reasons that I see global inflation edging higher. Um, what is the right amount of inflation? Um, you know, it, it still feels very strange to be talking about upside risks to inflation in the Eurozone, given what we've been focused on in the past decade. Um, and I worry much less about significant upside risks in the Eurozone than, than I do elsewhere. Um, but I do think it's worth keeping in mind that there is a happy medium. And some of the inflation that we're seeing in the US and emerging markets right now is proving a tax on, on the consumer. For me, for policy, that generates two challenges. Um, challenge number one is how do we make sure the balance is right? getting that right amount of transitory inflation, that we get inflation expectations up a little higher while avoiding too many negative spillovers elsewhere. Um, again, we, we haven't been here before for, for very, very understandable reasons in the last 18 months. Governments and central banks have delivered unprecedented amounts of stimulus. Um, it, it took the Fed um, 50 years to grow their balance sheet by $3 trillion. Um, it took them a year to grow up by the last $3 trillion. Um, so, you know, very much policy moving in the right direction, but to some extent, it's a little inevitable that there aren't some negative spillovers along the way. And there, you know, to some extent, I think we're seeing it in global house prices. We're seeing it in global asset prices in terms of equities and, and credit spreads. And that challenge between inflation and financial stability, I think, is going to be there much more in the next 18 to 24 months than it was in the last 10 to 12 to 18 months. Um, and then the second issue, much more longer term, is what this means for sovereign balance sheets. Um, public debt in, in developed markets is, is, is at the highest it's been since the Second World War. Um, Eurozone is running public debt at 100%, the US 130. Um, for me, debt sustainability is always as much about stock or flow as it is stock. Um, and, and I think it's worth remembering the improvements we've seen there within the Eurozone. Um, a decade ago, Eurozone governments were paying about 7% of revenue on interest. Today, they're paying three. Um, so this environment of very low interest rates has improved debt sustainability. Um, hopefully, going forward in the next decade, um, we will have a more sustainable recovery. We will have somewhat higher inflation. We will be able to transition away from these um, very low policy rates. But if that's going to be a constructive transition, I think what we're going to need to see is governments um, putting their balance sheets, getting their balance sheets back in shape, making sure that any of that expenditure that does happen um, brings sustainable and equitable growth. Um, and that we begin to see debt trajectories begin to turn downwards again. Let me just finish um, very quickly. A couple of thoughts on the Irish economy and what this all means for Ireland. The Irish economic story over the last few decades is, is a standout success globally. And part of that is very much down to the country's ability to, to adapt and leverage globalization. Um, but there are very significant shifts in the global economy underway, and, and that will generate change in Ireland, some of which will hopefully be good, but, but not all of it may be positive. Um, I've, I've seen the central bank speak of higher highs and lower lows for the, for the Irish economy. We, we experienced that in 2008, 2010. Um, and I think this really you know, speaks in favor of a, a discussion just to make sure that we have enough insurance as the recovery continues to take hold, as the recovery becomes more equitable and incorporates more sectors of the economy. Um, that as we put policy in place um, from a structural side and from a cyclical side, that it is done in a way that um, one benefits potential growth, but two also means that we have enough insurance 
um, not to not to end on a negative note, but there will unfortunately be another shock at some point in the future. Um, and I think that insurance is, is very important in, in maintaining social stability. Thanks, Gillian. That's brilliant. Um, appreciate those few words. Um, I'm going to go quickly on to our second panelist, who's Jim Reid. Uh, Jim is Managing Director and Global Head of the Fundamental Credit Strategy Group uh, in Deutsche Bank. He's been uh, Deutsche Bank since September 2004, and he heads up the thematic research product and corporate bank research. Uh, he is a top-ranked strategist, consistently named number one analyst in the major surveys over the last 25 years, uh, including 27 uh, number one positions in the last decade. So there has been inflation uh, visible uh, in, in that. Um, his, his early morning read has tens of thousands of daily readers, I'm really jealous, and is one of the most widely read financial pieces uh, in the investment world. Jim, uh, first time here as well. You're very welcome. Uh, look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you, Dermot. <coughs> very kind of you. Um, yeah, thank you for asking me to speak. Um, I, uh, I've worked with Gillian uh, probably about a decade ago, uh, and I haven't seen her since, but I'm, I'm afraid our views are quite similar. So I'm going to have to uh, struggle to uh, embol embellish them a little bit to, to, to stand out. Um, on, on the topic of uh, inflation, um, you know, this is a topic that is vexing us quite a bit at Deutsche Bank uh, in, in research. Uh, normally within our research team, we try to coalesce around the house view. You know, there's many senior strategists and we, we try to uh, get a house view. But I, in my 26 years of being at Deutsche Bank, I don't think I've seen a, a topic that divides as many of us on the senior research side as inflation. Um, so there are, I, I would say most of the economists believe that inflation is transitory and probably uh, a vocal minority, maybe on the margin of strategists, believe that inflation is more permanent. And I'm on that side. I believe inflation is more permanent <clears throat> going forward. So a bit like Julian, I'm going to give you kind of my personal take. It's not necessarily the view of the economists at Deutsche Bank, but I, I, I'm on the inflation uh, side. And <clears throat> maybe to give you some context, let's start back 40 years ago. You know, when we're at the end of the 1970s, when inflation was running high uh, and the policymakers were really struggling, th there was a, a conscious effort to deal with it. So the Fed finally, you know, towards the end of the 1979, uh, put Volcker in place at the Fed. And Volcker was a known critic of um, Fed policy, a known hawk. And it was quite clearly a very hawkish move to put Volcker in charge of, um, uh, of the Fed. Now, coincidentally, at the same time, Reagan gets elected and, and Reagan kind of uh, campaigned on a kind of a mandate of reducing government's involvement in the economy, letting free enterprise <clears throat> run, etc. And, you know, to cut a long story short, I think the ideology was tight monetary policy and uh, more restrained government involvement in the economy. So, you know, you could say tight fiscal and tight, tight monetary. It didn't always work out like that, but that was the ideology that kind of set us off uh, from the early 80s. And at the same time, I think you had an extraordinary demographic miracle about to happen. And Gillian touched on it. You had a, a surge in the working age force of the globe starting around about 1980. Globalization meant that China could contribute into that and they chose to. And there was a lot of cheap labor in inflow. So a lot of forces together work to actually dampen the uh, inflation environment. Uh, policy, um, f fabulous demographics which push down the price of workers, and globalization which, uh, you know, we know the consequence for inflation of, of, of that. If I fast forward 40 years now, <clears throat> last year the Fed almost, uh, you know, turned that upside down. Rather than have a, a deliberately hawkish uh, bias. They, they went to average inflation targeting, which is basically them saying we deliberately want to be behind the curve. We want to see actual sign that inflation is almost out of control before we uh, aggressively tighten policy. Now, that's, that's not what they're actually saying, but they basically want to see uh, you know, actual inflation uh, permanent inflation before they, they, they tighten uh, policy. Uh, whether you believe that's sustainable or not is, is a moot point, but that, that's kind of a, a big moment, I think. And obviously the ECB has, uh, in the last couple of months has, has kind of gone to a, 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 you know, a similar framework, not quite as aggressive, but a similar framework. So that, that's a very different uh, starting point. And you know, coincidentally, Biden gets elected last year, 
<clears throat> and you know, Biden has put social justice at the heart of his uh, presidency. And big government is well and truly back in the US. Uh, you know, I appreciate there are uh, arithmetic issues in, in the Senate and House, but overall, the desire for big government is well and truly back. And you've seen, you know, just ginormous fiscal packages uh, in the last uh, several months. And uh, with the infrastructure bill, that still could be another uh, big, <coughs> big uh, package. So. I think I think uh, the bias has moved now in the world, and especially post-pandemic, to uh, looser money, even looser monetary, and uh, looser fiscal. And I think that's even filtrated into to Europe. I think both the governor and Gillian have kind of hinted to that. It's less extreme in, in in Europe, but you know I think the stability pact is is if not dead, it's uh, resting for a number of years uh, a, a ahead. And you know, I think Europe will come out of this fiscally looser than it went into um, uh, the, the the COVID shock. And you know, with populations used to furloughs and and uh, and benefits and welfare schemes, I think it's going to be very difficult in the next recession uh, to go back to a standard <coughs> welfare framework. Um, you know, the furlough schemes have worked so well that I think the pressure will be to have them in future. You know, downturns. Uh, it's very costly. That's the problem. Uh, but that that's I think the direction of uh, travel. Now, I've gone 40 years there. Let's go back 10 years. Um, after the financial crisis, we ran very quickly into the Greek sovereign default uh, and the European peripheral uh, crisis. And at the same time, we had the Reinhardt and Rogoff uh, seminal work that said that uh, governments that get debt above kind of levels we're at now tend to have very bad outcomes. Uh, growth or crisis outcomes. So a combination of the sovereign <clears throat> crisis and the Reinhardt and Rogoff work and the zeitgeist at the time meant that governments were petrified of having a sovereign crisis land on their doorstep. So, you know, austerity was the order of the day. Um, and the problem with that, uh, and, you know, the governor hinted at it too, um, is that, you know, you were deleveraging the government balance sheets. And at the same time, either, reg uh, you know, regulation was forcing banks to deregulate. The fact that they had bloated balance sheets was, was also contributing to that. And households were de uh, delevering as well. So you had major parts of the economy retracting uh, simultaneously. And I think that's part of the reason you had not only kind of a weak recovery, but you had uh, weak inflation. And even in the US, which wasn't as extreme, it took until 2017, so seven and a half years after the crisis really started, or you could argue a bit longer really, it took until 2017 for the output gap and the employment gap in the US to close. That is the longest cycle in any in history uh, for the output and employment gap to, to, to close. So, you know, you're hardly going to get much inflation pressures in an economy <clears throat> if you're operating below uh, p potential. Um, now, in this cycle, uh, the US economy will have closed its output gap and its employment gap on consensus estimates from here by the end of this year. So we've only got a few months to wait until the US economy is back at full capacity relative to you know, its ability to, uh, to produce. <clears throat> and that's less than two years after the uh, COVID recession. And that's pretty much the quickest recovery on record to close uh, an output or an employment gap. And I suppose what that what that means is that at that point, you should be starting to get the cyclical inflation pressures that you would normally get when an economy is quite late in a, in a, in a cycle. And I think the mistake that financial markets are making today is that there's too much um, templating of the last cycle onto this cycle. So when we see government bond yields where they are today, <clears throat> I think a lot of that is anchoring to the kind of trends we saw uh, in, in the last uh, cycle, whereas I think a lot of the trends now are pretty, uh, pretty different. And remember, when the US economy does hit its uh, full potential, there will still be huge levels of excess savings because of all the stimulus, the stimulus checks, etc. And, uh, you know, uh, savings that the US consumer has done during the pandemic. So you've got a kind of a powder keg of of savings. Uh, now, there's no real great model we have to predict how quickly those savings will be spent. Uh, there is debate on that too, but even the fact that they're there <clears throat> in an economy that's at full capacity, you know, does I think put the inflation risk to the uh, to the upside. So, you know, this is not talking about the transitory inflation we're seeing now. Um, 
I mean, I have less conviction on the transitory inflation we're, we, we are seeing now. Um, I think there will be some permanent supply shocks from the pandemic that will keep inflation elevated, but I'm probably more confident on the, you know, the fact that we're hitting uh, constraints quicker in this cycle than we did uh, b b before. And, you know, I come back to the structural fa factors I mentioned at the start, um, you know, demographics. I, I agree with the thesis that demographics in the last 40 years has been disinflationary. That may be not the consensus view, but I think uh, the working age population has exploded so much in size around the world with a lot of cheap labour uh, from China and emerging markets that you've, you've had a massive downward pressure on, on, on inflation. Going forward, the demographics are weakening. Uh, the consensus view is that an Asian society is bad for inflation, but you know I, I would take the counter view seriously that um, if you have less uh, people in the workforce, the price of labour uh, can go up. And if you couple that, and sorry, it's not just a developed world thing. China is suffering the same issue, and don't forget, China now has much higher wages than it did at the start of this period. So I think it's going to be a period where lower-paid workers uh, do better as you know, their scarcity starts to uh, build in. And I think the politics are changing as well. I think most governments around the world are realizing that the politics of having inequality as wide as it is, is not very, is not very good for their electoral chances. So I think politics is going to be more biased towards the lower paid worker. And I think that that means that, you know, we are going to get a bit more wage inflation uh, come through uh, in, in, in the years as, as ahead. And, you know, that's a good thing. Uh, but it does cause policy uh, issues for, uh, you know, central banks and, 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 and governments. Um, you know, other structural forces, um, ESG and oil, and I link that into inflation expectations. You know, a, a decade ago, we had the shale revolution in the US. Uh, and, you know, for a few years after, you know, after the financial crisis, the shale industry was roaring. Um, then OPEC plus, well, OPEC re retaliated. Uh, and massively increased production and oil slumped from you know to late 2013 onwards and it didn't recover really until now so from 2013 to 2020 you had a very very sharp fall in the price of oil uh, because of shale and opec retaliating and if you look at a graph of the price of oil against inflation expectations they're pretty uh, tightly correlated. If you look at a graph around turning points in monetary policy historically, it's often very correlated to the to the price of oil. And you know, I do think we're probably going for a period now where the price of commodities is going to stay elevated. Um, I, I, I think ESG will play a part in that for, for two reasons. Firstly, you know, in an ESG world, it's going to be more difficult to extract commodities from the ground, uh, you know, in, on a dirt cheap basis because there's going to be environmental constraints. I don't think the shale industry would be able to start today. I don't think you'd be able to invent the shale industry today. I don't think you'd be able to invent a lot of the, the uh, you know, the extraction industry uh, today. And I think the cost of doing business is going to uh, go up. I think even the green revolution will require infrastructure that will bid up the price of, uh, of commodities. So, you know, it's all very well saying electric vehicles are the way forward, but they require a huge amount of commodities from uh, you know, from mines and, and, and the ground around the world. And that, I think, will keep uh, a price uh, of energy for, uh, up. And, you know, I think I think commodity prices are probably set for a period of more elevated uh, prices than they had before. So I think people are still stuck in that 2013, 2020 mentality in terms of inflation expectations, price of commodities, et cetera. And I think going forward, we are going to be in a higher inflation expectation uh, regime and that will, I think, eventually impact inflation and impact uh, bond yields. And look, a globalization, uh, you know, like Gillian, I, it's difficult to tell where it's going to go. But I, I do sense that you know, key the key relationship in the globalization story is probably the U.S.-China one. And for me, it doesn't get better; it gets worse. And I, I think that means we have to assume that we aren't going to be in the kind of unfettered globalization era we've been in. There will still be uh, a lot of cooperation between uh, uh, people around the globe, but it's going to be more difficult. Countries are going to be a bit more protectionist, a bit more isolationist. Uh, and the US-China relationship probably means that, you know, countries might have a struggle to uh, brace both worlds in the future. So, you know, and that might be a bit more inflationary uh, going forward. <clears throat> the final thing I, I would say, 
uh, and I, I've just published a big study on this, we are in a fiat money world. Fiat money has historically been inflationary. My my gut feel is that in, in the, you know, the, we had the 50 year anniversary of fiat money last month. For the first decade, fiat money was overwhelmingly inflationary. Uh, and then for the last 40, I think you've had exogenous factors that have kind of brought us down uh, to where in the last decade inflation was quite low, which, you know, could have actually saved fiat money from collapsing. So, you know, the, the, the demographics, the globalization, you know, I think these are all external forces. And I, I think perhaps people in the market sometimes underestimate those external forces. Uh, and if those external forces become more neutral, then the era of fiat money where governments can borrow uh, as much as they reasonably like and central banks can print, uh, you know, uh, unlimited money, I think is, is, is inflationary. So the underlying monetary regime we have is underlyingly very inflationary. It's just that exogenous forces have offset that for a, you know, for a period of time, and whether they can going forward is a, is a more moot point. So that that's kind of my opening remarks. Excellent, and um, lots of good stuff there, especially this whole thing about you know recency bias that we can often get a, accused of looking at the last cycle and assume it's going to go back to that. Um, I think the last 18 months or so have reminded us that we have to maybe look back a little bit more uh, in history. Okay, on to, on to our third panellist, uh, who is a long-time supporter of the DEW. It's Mark Coleman, uh, who is Director of Octavian, Octavian Economics and Public Affairs Consultancy and a, is a former ECB economist, a Senior Manager with IBEC and Economics Editor with the Irish Times and News Talk. He has authored five books, on Ireland's economic recovery, uh, including the world's first, no less, response to the COVID-19 crisis and economic response to COVID-19. Mark, you're very welcome back. Better, better get you to unmute. Thank you, Jim, um, for the warm welcome and honor of sharing the platform with the governor and with Jim and Gillian as well. I know that your other speakers are waiting your Q&A uh, contributors are waiting to get in, so I'll be as quick as I can. I'm going to complement the contribution so far um, by looking at recent trends with some data. Um, and I'm going to look at the causes of inflation as I see them, the consequences, the risks and the remedies. And I'm probably going to not only be siding with Gillian and Jim on their analysis in terms of a higher than lower risk of inflation, I'm probably going to be even more um, more out on that side. Can I start, though, by warmly welcoming the signals that have come from the governor in relation to the strategy review? Because in my first second book on the last crisis, Back from the Brink, I pointed to several uh, factors that I thought had biased monetary policy uh, in a looser direction, including the failure to look at the impact of globalization on what we now call the natural rate of interest. Um, I would have put it that the globalization force actually flattered and misguided us in policy formation. And that misguidance was contributed to by other factors that fragmented monetary policy thinking in a way that I went into the book in some detail. So I'm delighted that the strategy review is no holds barred. And we now have an opportunity to recalibrate. And later in my presentation, I'll point to the risk of what I call retrospective policy analysis, whereby when we do <coughs> incorporate, for example, owner occupier price levels, house price levels into uh, the measure of the HICP, we will need to explain um, some historical disparities as we did in 2001, I think, when we looked at monetary policy statistics when I was in the monetary policy division. But that review is welcome and also the fiscal and mon monetary policy coordination is something we've long needed to look at. I recall in the last crisis how a counter cyclical move 375 basis point reduction very, very welcome by the ECB, but was unfortunately gobbled up in a very adverse pro cyclical round of tax increases, which we are still suffering from. So let me get to the let me get into the uh, presentation. Hopefully you can see it. Um, there are just a few of our publications on the previous and current crisis. I just show them because I'll be referring to them briefly. 
and we've also published extensively on the challenge of sustainability and uh, the governor's remarks are very welcome in that regard as well let me go right to the top um so in on june the 20th uh, june june the 11th we we had waited uh, for March, we had waited until the consumer price index reached the February 2020 level before paying any attention to it, because we, we all know that there was some recovery in price levels post pandemic. But by June, that point had more than been passed. And we saw forces that really have nothing to do with the pandemic emerging. <clears throat> and in our client briefing, we looked at deglobalization. China Chinese producer prices rising at 9% and accelerating energy prices, partly pandemic base year effects, but also climate action pressures, which are not going away. Pent up property price pressures, which I call kinetic inflation, 94% <coughs> rise in property prices since 2013. And some unique Irish factors, a lack of competition in our internal sector and what we call Dutch disease, which is the impact on pricing in the domestic economy of quite massive FDI flows from multinational sectors that are higher value, higher price, and that can absorb uh, inflation, but the SME sector that has to deal with that cannot. The latest trends are quite scary. Um, we need to emphasize that the recovery in pre-pandemic prices was over by February. Um, prices bottomed out in October. They spent five months uh, recovering. By February 20 uh, of this year, they had recovered from, a, for, and by March, they had a reading of 102.7 for the CPI, <coughs> slightly above the February 2020, the last pre pandemic month reading of 102.3. And since then, prices have not only been rising above pandemic levels, but as you can see from the chart, doing so at a robust level. And we've had 1.9% price increases in five months alone. Um, <clears throat> that's equivalent to an annualized rate of about 5%. Ballpark. Uh, the culprits are energy up 16%, utilities and local charges up nearly 15%. <clears throat> Tobacco also in there and alcohol. I think we need to note here we have an obsession with virtue taxes in this country uh, on tobacco and alcohol. Um, but what we have seen is now we have reached price levels in those categories that are 220% and 180% of the EU average. Um, we, uh, they're highly regressive. Um, they are virtuous, quote unquote, but they may also be virtue signaling in that it's not clear that in the case of alcohol, they have much of an impact on consumption by misusers of alcohol. It's much more likely now that we've squeezed out any any of that benefit and the sole impact is it just makes life more miserable for lower income families without actually changing consumption in the middle in red i want you to pay attention to two figures that came from my analysis in back from the brink um, in terms of inflationary pressures in the indigenous non-competitive sector of the economy and the more competitive external side between January uh, 2003 and June 2009, rail travel prices increased by 40%. That's a sheltered monopoly. But air travel prices actually fell by 6.7%. We're seeing strong evidence of that again. Um, so we need to have a sectoral mindset here in terms of advising policymakers. And we're also going to have to really ask whether the problem is tax cuts, which benefit lower income families in terms of inflationary impact. These figures suggest that if government spending increases on the current side are far, far more of an inflationary risk. And I think it would be welcome if the governor and the Central Bank of Ireland gave consideration to that. Although remarks about capital investment are well taken, capital investment is, as I will argue strongly in a few minutes, beneficial to reducing inflationary pressures. It's interesting to compare and contrast the last inflationary bout we saw between August 2004 and August 2008, uh, consumer prices rose by 16.6%. Uh, some people attempted to blame this on tax cuts. That's absolute illiterate nonsense. The motivator of that increase was the 200 billion increase in private sector credit. The notion that tax cuts have anything to do with it uh, 
but might have had, had marginal impact was absolute illiterate nonsense that I read time and time again. This was a case, as Milton Friedman says, of inflation being a monetary uh, phenomenon and the momentum of that rise in pr private sector credit uh, was absolutely overpowering. And the, um, the various reports um, that, that looked back at central bank and banking behavior prove that. Uh, the latest momentum of prices um, on the right hand side suggests that it's quite possible we may see a repeat of this. And by the way, I have calibrated the index axes, so they're they're pretty much identical in terms of the span. So you, they are broadly proportionate. You can compare the two charts. The line in green is the central bank, and we all hope the central bank is right. I'm praying that you know the central bank of Ireland, the ECB, are right about what they're saying. Unfortunately, my gut instinct is that the red line is more likely to materialise, and I will say why. We have not had in the last couple of years a private sector credit expansion but look at what we have had look at the figure in the the, the line in red in the last full year pre-pandemic we had 192 billion euros invested in the irish economy now while it's true to say that much of that was repatriated much of it wasn't i haven't had time to done, do the number crunching on this <clears throat> but for a single year we are looking at FDI flows into the economy in 2019 that are um, being still ongoing and are on a par, if not exceeding the momentum of credit and money that came into the economy between 2004 and 2008. That is why I believe the Irish inflation story is much, much more than post-pandemic price unwind. How do we hold the slide? In the long term, it's about housing and infrastructure. We cannot stress that enough. Massive investment hitting domestic infrastructure capacity constraints is a major part of Ireland's inflation story. The other is population growth. <clears throat> In the medium term, frankly, I have to question whether our competition authority is fit for purpose. Uh, it's got wonderful individuals in it, but I think it's time to merge part with the Consumer Information or Citizens Information Bureau and really ramp that organization up um, because what I've shown you in the foregoing slides shows that inflation reason is not only a monetary phenomenon, it's a phenomenon uh, that is uh, very badly contributed to by a lack of competition. In the short term, we need to be careful um, in considering uh, the inflationary impact uh, of tax cuts versus current spending. The narrative is tax cuts cause inflation. I don't see any evidence of that. If anyone has evidence of it, put it forward. But I don't think we're talking about tax cuts. Um, in a year when we've had a restoration of public sector pay, I think we need to restore the tax austerity that was inflicted on the private sector um, uh, during the last crisis. Um, and we know private sector incomes are one third lower than public sector incomes. So I think particularly the policymakers are coming from public institutions, which are publicly funded, and where pay and pensions are immunized largely from inflation, they need to be very, very mindful that from the private sector's point of view, average incomes are lower. And this is a sector that is still bearing the burden of the uh, reduction in disposable income from tax austerity. So I think the way to, to uh, address the spending disposable income impact uh, caused by higher prices, it's not tax cuts, it's actually just reversing the tax austerity that is still on people's shoulders from the previous crisis. And we need to bear in mind that the spending austerity on the public side has already more than been reversed. We have had an annual increase of 16 billion euro in public spending between 2015 and 2019. So public austerity is not only over, public spending is well, well above those levels, but private sector after-tax incomes are still at the levels inflicted by the previous crisis. We should really be careful about virtue tax hikes. We already have alcohol and tobacco prices that are almost double the EU average. In relation to carbon tax increases, we all agree this is necessary. This is about our children's future. However, there's an old saying in Irish, um, always mend the roof on a sunny day. That these and water charges and other tax measures are best implemented in times of prosperity. When you implement them in times of recession, the risk is that they get confused and conflated 
with a general austerity narrative. We saw water charges came a cropper because they were seen as a sneaky way of raising taxes rather than what they actually were, which was a well-intentioned uh, measure to get us to be all more responsible about water uses. That could happen with carbon tax ra rises. So I would propose that for every increase in the carbon tax over the next eight years until 2029, there is an offsetting reduction in income tax so that it is made clear to citizens that um, whereas they may grumble about any increases in overall taxation, that carbon taxes are compensated for, that they're not a sneaky way to raise taxes, that they are a way to change behavior. Risks to the outlook. Um, I would say that the global supply chain pressure, I, I, I hope and pray that the central bank is right, but unfortunately my interaction with clients in the private suggest, uh, sector suggests <clears throat> that global supply chain price is far more durable and going to be more long lasting than economists realize. Rising geopolitical tensions do not over well, and that reduction in the natural interest rate that occurred after the fall of the Berlin Wall I feel will partly reverse, and that's a part of the story. The second risk is what I call kinetic inflation. Uh, I'm delighted that the strategy review has resulted in owner-occupier prices being included in the HICP. It won't happen yet, but when it does, I'm afraid there's going to be an awful lot of catch-up, particularly in this country, where house prices have risen 94% in the last uh, eight years or so. So I think we're going to have to have a period of reflection on what the central bank would have done had that strategy review occurred uh, seven or eight years ago. Finally, f uh, fiscal competitiveness and the German election. Um, on the fiscal side, we're going to see massive pressures uh, for government to continue support for the economy. Um, that has inflationary risks. Um, we're going to see the private sector demanding catch up with the public sector. If the public sector demands pay increases on the back of higher inflation, uh, we're going to see the private sector want the same thing. And I'm very alarmed by the fact that in the recent by-election in Dublin Bay South, 65% did not vote. There were plenty of candidates on the left of the field, but very few candidates advocating uh, for the taxpayer. And I fear that we are heading towards a pre-Brexit style divisiveness in that narrative. The final risk I will mention is the German election. 40% of German voters are undecided. There's large concern about the impact of what they regard as weak monetary policy on asset prices. Young people cannot afford to buy houses. Older people are concerned about their savings. Um, and that will lead to fragmentation in the vote. And that will ironically lead to more bargaining at cabinet level and higher rates of spending and any political economist worth their salt will tell you that that leads to inflationary pressures. But it's not just in Germany. The key point to note here is Germany has been the anchor of fiscal stability and responsibility. So if the Germans begin to borrow and spend, 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 um, well, the Italians, the Greeks, the uh, Portuguese, the Irish, the Spanish, the French, are going to say, well, if the German, if it's good enough for Germany, it's good enough for us. So if I were pointing to the biggest risk for inflation, I think that is it. Finally, some implications if we if if I'm right, and I hope I am not right, by the way, if I'm right, <coughs> the, the risks are quite significant, um, particularly for Ireland. We already have the most expensive cost of living, according to Eurostat. Our SME sectors is challenged by Dutch disease, which is effectively the cost impact on the indigenous business caused by the massive spending power of in, uh, multinationals. And they also SMEs will also face uh, challenges of higher pay, pay demands if public sector unions success, uh, succeed in demanding higher pay and compensation for inflation. And by the way, that's not a criticism of public sector unions. That's what they're paid to do. Uh, it's their job, so I'm not criticizing them at all, but it will have both knock-on pay demand effects in the private sector, which will affect the more vulnerable small business sector, and of course it will impact on the fiscal space. Finally, social and demographic and political impacts. The ESRI study, very welcome study in May on living standards, shows that um, many, many young people are now at the pin of their collar, 
and are earning lower in re lesser uh, have lower incomes in real terms than their counterparts in the 90s and 2000s had. Uh, I come back to virtue taxation. I remember one public representative saying that alcohol, for example, was available for pocket money prices. This was quite an ironic remark and perhaps somebody from who, who may be a little sheltered from reality, because if you look at take home pay for many younger people in our economy after they've paid the rent, pocket money is all they have left. And I really think policymakers are going to have to seriously confront a lack of understanding of what life is like on the front line of our economy, because we are heading for serious social divisions if they do not, which leads me to my final point. Um, we are a deeply divided economy between a resilient high income and a fantastic multinational sector, far from criticizing it, I'm praising it and I've helped it in my past, but we need to raise alarm bells about the growing gap between its resilience and once the pandemic supports are withdrawn, the very, very vulnerable private sector that is not sheltered by uh, pay bargaining, not sheltered by protected pay and pensions. And the reason inflation is, 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 is important is it will exacerbate those divides. To sum it up in one sentence, I'm not denying that most of the inflation we have seen to date is pandemic related unwind. What I am saying is that there are many, many other factors in the background that will be triggered. They have been lying in wait and they will be triggered by this pandemic price reversal um, unless we act. So that's it. And thank you very much for your attention. And it's 10 minutes, I think 11 minutes past one. So hopefully I've left some time for Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, Mark, thanks very much. Uh, and uh, thanks for the, the policy recommendations as well. We, we, we do like them here. So we're going to bring the, the panel back back in. And um, it's interesting. Um, it, it looks like uh, it's three against one uh, here, Governor. And, and this wasn't uh, this wasn't designed uh, at, at all in terms of the uh, the transitory camp versus the more uh, permanent camp. And I think it's uh, the, the first question, uh, which is from uh, all that's been identified as a financial market participant, kind of feeds into this particular issue. And I'll maybe put it to the governor first. Uh, and maybe get a brief uh, comment from the uh, other panelists as well. Um, what would change the panel's view uh, or what indicator? do you look at to either uh, confirm your position in relation to uh, your view on inflation uh, or change that view? Maybe to, your, to you, Governor, first. Thanks, um, Dermot. And if I could just, just say, I found uh, uh, Mark, Jim, and Gillian's um, contributions really interesting. And uh, I... Uh, I'd quite happily spend quite a long time talking about all that. But just to answer that question, I don't think there's a single factor that certainly would change my mind. I, I'd want to look quite carefully at uh, a number of, uh, of different indicators before coming to a view. I mean, the, the one thing I, will, I did say earlier, which I'll repeat, um, is that we are... We are living in pretty extraordinarily uncertain times. Um, the nature of the pandemic, um, in, in, in many ways, it's, much, it's a much bigger shock uh, than the global financial crisis. Um, because the global financial crisis was a crisis about the financial system, ultimately. Whereas the pandemic, or more precisely, more accurately, the um, the decisions by governments to voluntarily close down economies could have much bigger structural uh, changes uh, re resulting, which I think is too soon to say whether or not they're going to emerge. So um, I think a lot of my comments and my view actually about um, inflation right now is, and I think Mark made this point right at the end then, um, is that what we're seeing right now is uh, transitory and is pandemic related, uh, both slacks, as I put this conundrum of both slacks and uh, bottlenecks. Um, but if you look further out in the horizon, um, almost beyond the medium term, I wouldn't disagree that the number of uh, uh, pressures um, 
are more potentially uh, uh, longer lasting. The one thing that nobody said on that I heard on the panel, um, but I, you know, I almost have to say this, is that I did say it in my speech, um, is that we will respond. You know, if if we conclude that actually this is more than transitory, we will respond. And there's almost a bit of a sense that central banks are going to sit uh, and just watch all this happen, um, which uh, was certainly uh, not at the ECB. If I could make one point, because I think just to sort of, uh, which Jim, Jim said something, uh, which is correct, but I just want to sort of uh, address it. He said he was comparing the Fed and the ECB, and he described the Fed, Fed's position, I think, reasonably well. Um, but two things that I think the audience needs to just be rem reminded of. Uh, firstly, the ECB has not adopted average inflation targeting. And, uh, you know, I've said this uh, in public just for the avoidance of doubt, which the Fed has. And secondly, the Fed's mandate is different to the ECB's. I mean, I think in, in a lot of popular media, um, in particular, it's, you know, because we're all central banks, we all sort of have this, the assumption, automatic assumption, is that we have the same mandate. Uh, the Fed's mandate, the Fed's got a dual mandate. The ECB's mandate is price stability. The Fed's is price stability and maximum sustainable employment. And one of the reasons um, that they have uh, adopted the, the current strategy is to deliver what, in their view, um, in particular, is the maximum sustainable employment bit of it. So I think it's important to, when we're, judge, when we're assessing what different central banks are doing, is just to remember that there are different mandates operating. I'll stop there. Thanks, just in the interest of time, I'm just going to um, go across to Jim here for, for this particular question. Jim, you, you, you look historical statistics. You know, what, what is the, the indicator that you look at on a daily basis and that might change your mind on, on your current view on inflation? Um, I, I suppose to confirm it, I, I suppose it would be helpful if you had wage inflation. That would be uh, a real confirmation that inflation was genuine. I think if if I I would start to have doubts if if I really thought that we would be going back to a pre-pandemic fiscal environment where governments across the world went back to uh, you know very tight uh, policy. Obviously, in, in Europe, that's always a risk. Uh, if divided government in the US, it's a risk. But uh, you know, even in the US, I think uh, if we go back we'll still go back to a uh, fairly uh, a lot of uh, a higher deficit level than we had pre-pandemic but you might not get the same stimulus so i suppose a risk to my view is that the fiscal goes back to where we were pre-pandemic i don't think it will but that would be uh, uh the, the bigger risk okay great right I, i'm going to um put the next question which is from uh, brian hayes uh, to Gillian first and then to mark also uh, does the panel think we need to incentivize people to use their savings for investment purposes, such as long-term pension requirements, rather than short-term spending, which will contribute to inflationary pressures in the economy? Gillian, any, any thoughts on, on what government should do to harness this saving? Yeah, maybe let me just um, come back first on the last question, if you don't mind briefly. I, I think what makes me wrong or what, what would change the view, the fact that we've got three economists in one virtual room with the same view, I think is always a red flag that we should keep in mind. I'm a strategist, um, not I, an economist. Don't, don't bring me down <laughs> to your level. I'm a strategist. But, but you know, I, I would say, I think I'm probably, I am much more open to the view or that, um, well, one, it's very hard to call this at this point, but two, it could actually be a very nice sweet spot for the ECB. Um, given the challenges that they have faced in the past decade relative um, relative to the Fed. Um, should, should we be encouraging individuals, is that correct, to, to save longer term? I think from a demographic perspective, that makes, um, that makes a lot of sense at this point. Um, it's clear we have an aging cycle ahead of us. There are question marks about how that is paid for. Um, and... Um, 
yeah, given excess savings across Europe and the US, you know, it, it's not clear at this point that we need to run those savings down at, full, at all, I think. Um, well, um, if you'll permit me to just for a split second share a, a slide with you, uh, if I can. Um, it's it's up there. I don't know if you can see it, but yeah. uh, it's it's a, we had the privilege of last November um, <clears throat> publishing from aspiration to operation, scoping Ireland's potential in green finance and policy conditionality with the National Economic and Social Council. Uh, I'll stop sharing now because I just wanted to, I really just wanted to flash it up so you can you can remove it if you want. Um, the point in answer to Brian's question is yes. Um, Charlie McCreevy, when he was there, um, he didn't always get everything right, but I think the special savings incentivization scheme that he brought in was a clever uh, strategy which tried to alleviate inflation at the time. And um, there are questions of social equity around it in that you do benefit people who probably have higher incomes. And that's something that you would need to scratch your head about. But the reason I flashed that publication on is what I think we need to do much more is look at the very important work that the EU Commission is doing on taxonomy to incentivize private sector investment in uh, climate resilient um, infrastructure of the kind that the governor was talking about earlier on. We're in a very exciting potential where there's an awful, an awfully high appetite in the private sector, pension funds, fund managers looking for sustainable long term investments that are not necessarily the best investments in terms of financial return, but have, have a good environment uh, record. But in order to facilitate that, we need to develop the taxonomy and the green finance agenda. So I know it's a slightly indirect answer to Brian's question, but if I had to put something as top priority, it would be advancing that. And I'm looking forward to Budget 2022 to see whether Pascal Donahue can work any magic, magic in that regard. Okay, very good. Um, so there's there's a couple of questions around uh, kind of monetary policy uh, and and ECB, which obviously I'll put to the governor, uh, and and I put three three questions together. You know, one is when will ECB QN, another is saying, you know, if if the inflation forecast uh, in the medium term that the ECB has published is only reaching one point six, then why isn't ECB providing more stimulus? Um, uh, any views on on, on both of those, I suppose, I'll, 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 leave, I'll send it over to you, Governor. I mean, that's, um, when will QE end is, um, what a great question. Uh, but, uh, I mean, the short answer is uh, uh, probably before we raise interest rates. Um, uh, and I won't say anything about timing um, precisely on that. Uh, on um, our forecasts, I want to just uh, make one point clear. The forecasts are the staff's, ECB staff's projections. Uh, they don't represent the views of the governing council. Um, but obviously, we take them into account when we uh, make our decisions. And um, we explain our deliberations in what the president says at the end of our meeting. So. Uh, I mean, it is something which we will be looking pretty carefully at. And I mean, some of us do believe that actually the forecasts are too pessimistic. Uh, some of us do believe that the, uh, at the moment, uh, the forecast of reaching inflation of 1.5% in uh, 2023 is too low, which is what the staff have projected. So there is a discussion and a debate to be had. And... Ultimately, as I said when I spoke earlier, uh, it's it's about us being pretty vigilant with what's going on, and um, and also being humble. That uh, you know what, as economists, um, uh, the one thing we are certain sorry I am certain about is there's a lot of uncertainty out there, and we can't we don't know everything. And um, it is, uh, it's not a mechanical exercise. And unfortunately, a lot of the projections are mechanical exercises. It is ultimately the decisions we make are questions of judgment. And um, what I can assure your listeners and, and viewers is that um, if we think, and if we see evidence, as we said earlier, uh, 
that inflation is going to uh, uh, go above our target, um, we'll respond. That is absolutely, uh, that will absolutely happen. Um, but uh, a lot of this is sort of work in progress and keep watching for the evidence. Very clear, very clear. Okay, um, interesting one here. Uh, and I'm going to put this to Jim and if any of the other uh, panelists want to also answer it, just put their hand up physically. Uh, do we need, uh, do we actually need a period of control above target inflation to help, the, to help make the sovereign debt government debt burdens more sustainable? So you, you mentioned Reinhardt and Rogoff this time is different earlier on. Uh, I mean, is, is, is this period of, of higher inflation actually necessary? Well, I, I've been on record quite a few times in the last few years as saying that I think for the rest of my career, real yields will be negative um, because that's the only way you can finance just a huge amount of uh, uh, government debt out there without there being a, a crisis. I think if real yields go positive for a period of time, then uh, it, the whole financial system probably comes down because of all, all the debt. And I suppose the, I suppose the pushback I would give to the, the governor is um, uh, he obviously said the ECB would respond to higher inflation. But if that response precipita precipitated a debt crisis, I, I'm not I don't know quite how the ECB would react. And that is one of I think the, 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 the I think one of the problems in the next decade is if you do get exogenous inflation, you know, through no fault of anybody, policymakers, etc., how the central bank banks respond. Do they protect the inflation mandate? And obviously the ECB has, has strictly got a price man, uh, mandate, but the ECB has also uh, financed sovereigns over the last decade. So that's, I suppose, the question. You know, how, how would the central banks respond if you got an exogenous increase in inflation, which threatened uh, the debt sustainability of a weaker member country? Governor, do you want to respond? If, if, if I'm... I'm... Just, just governor first, and I can come on to you, Mark. Sorry. I was, I was, I was only going to say um, that uh, that we're actually, you know, this is tricky territory uh, for the ECB because, uh, and I have to formally disagree with, uh, although I know what what he was saying with Jim about uh, us uh, uh, funding uh, sovereigns because actually we are prevented by the treaty. Um, but uh, from from monetary financing, as it's described, so uh, we could get we could have this whole separate discussion. Um, but is we're very clear in our mandate. Our mandate is price stability, and um, uh, at the end of the day, I'm pretty certain that all my governing council colleagues would agree um, that that's our job, and uh, you know that is our that is what we would do um, and what we hope, what I hope, um, is that all the players in the economic uh, um, universe, if I can put it like that, you know, governments, uh, you know, fiscal authorities, etc., cetera, um, actually work together to deal with the sort of challenges that uh, may be ahead of us. I mean, part of the problem, back to, again, what I spoke about, um, within the EU itself is we've got this fragmented macroeconomic framework that uh, doesn't work very well, just to be uh, blunt about it, um, and uh, creates its own headache for us. All right, very briefly. Just... Thank you. you very briefly. I share the governor's caution on this for different reasons. Um, this idea of, um, you know, above target inflation for, for a couple of months or years was conceived in the 60s and 70s when things were far more homogeneous. This such a policy would have much, much differing uh, impacts on older uh, demographics versus younger, private sector versus public. Uh, it would exacerbate divisions that have been um, laid bare by the pandemic. I think it's a very politically dangerous idea. Thanks, Mark. I can just, sorry, Dermot, if I can just make one small point uh, to this specific question. Um, which is history teaches us that um, if inflation, uh, too high inflation, let me use that phrase, um, is very sticky. Um, and uh, uh, running, in, running uh, inflation much higher above target, I think, carries disproportionate risks, which would outweigh the benefits. Okay, great. Well, that's a good way to finish the session.
Um, and I'd like to thank you, Governor, um, and I'd like to thank Mark Coleman, Gillian Edgeworth, uh, Jim Reid for your contributions. This is obviously the last session of this year's uh, conference. Uh, if you're to believe Gillian, Jim, and Mark, you want to book your hotel rooms for the conference in Wexford when we go back uh, next September. Uh, I mean, our, our goal in DUW conference is, is to be and to offer a forum for, for economic debate. Um, I, I think that the online version of this ha has opened up kind of a new audience, uh, both in terms of contributors and, 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 and the listeners and the viewers that are on it. So, uh, so I hope that would mean that we'll kind of build on that over the next, <clears throat> next number of years. It doesn't happen without a, a voluntary uh, committee. Uh, and I'd just like to thank, uh, in particular, Yvonne McCarthy from the Central Bank for being the chair uh, this year, but also Ronan Lyons, Barra Rowntree, Jenny Connors, uh, ben Breen and Averick McGibney of Dublin Chamber, who again uh, sponsored this year's event. Uh, I shall see you all soon in person. Thanks very much again and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Dermot. Thanks, Governor. Thanks, folks. Thank you.